So this is data from Bolivia. Came out the end of last year, and it's from the year 2003. Demographic data is always delayed because it takes a long time to collect it and analyze it and so forth. And this is uh, a fairly standard thing uh, that's happening. Uh, this is various five-year bunches. They take these surveys every five years. This is from a thing called the Demographic and Health Surveys, which are done basically in every developing country of the world by their own statistical service. Every country has a fairly decent census and statistical service. And they go and ask uh, either all the women if it's a census year or a subset of the women uh, if it's not a census year. And they ask all kinds of questions, some of which you will see. The first thing, of course, is how many children do you have? And they used, when they started these kind of surveys, they used to ask men, and they would get a number, the husband. Then they'd ask the wife, get a different number. <laughs> and when they checked, it turns out the woman was right and the man had no clue. And Vina will tell you maybe some stories about, it's not even a simple question, even to the woman, how many children have, have you had? Um, uh, but uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, men's data was unreliable, and in the early days, they really were interested in getting a real ground base. They didn't know how many people there were in the world, what the fertility rates were, how fast the population was growing. So just to get the basic ideas, women were asked. And from that date on, men have somewhat been excluded from the data collection. So a lot of what we know, in fact, almost all of what we know is, is, is about women. But nowadays, it's changing. In the last number of years, people realize it takes two to tango, and men are starting to come more into the picture. Anyway, here by 19, this is so this five-year age group, and this is the total fertility rate. And in 1965 uh, and 70 and other years, they were having six, roughly 6.6 .6 children. Then gradually, every five-year increment, it came down until the most recent number is 3.8 uh, children. Now, and keep that 3.8 number in mind, because we want to compare that to some other things. And uh, you probably know a little about Bolivia. It's totally Catholic. It's quite poor. It's mostly agricultural. It's not very urbanized. Education is at a fairly low level. And the status of women there is not really wonderful. So with all those indicators, what they call social, social indicators, what would you think about the fertility desires of women in Bolivia? High, low? High. All of those are sort of standard classical factors that would make you think that they want uh, a lot of children. But when you look at the actual data, it's rather moderate. It's, uh, it's still very high by our standards of, of one or two children, but still, it, and it's still important for the world because at 3.8, uh, you du double the population almost every, not quite double it every generation. So this is quite high, but it's nothing like a six, a seven child thing or in the past, you know, the traditional number of seven or eight or maybe nine children uh, per woman. So uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a situation of moderate uh, fertility. Now, what the, ne the next kind of set of questions is, well, this is the number of children you're having. How many do you want? And they ask, this is asked, it's a very tricky kind of question, as you, you'll probably hear. So there's a lot of different ways of spinning uh, this question. So the first is, they ask you, uh, did you want your last child? And that has a whole, again, complicated set of answers. And just look out here for the, for the total numbers that did you want the child at the time that you had it? Well, 38% of women said, yes, I wanted it when, when I had it. But not wanted at all, somewhat larger, 40% of women didn't want it at all. That's a surprising split. And then in between is another 20% of women who gave a am more ambiguous answer well, I didn't really want the child right then, but I probably would have wanted a child in the future. And there's a lot of guesswork on the part of the respondent in that about what their future desires will be. And as you know, humans change their mind every five minutes on important topics. But that's a very interesting statistic that there's more children unwanted than are wanted, and uh, that's somewhere in, in between. Um, now, there's probably a lot of bias in this data. This is not considered 
wonderful data because you're asking a woman who's just had a child or fairly recently had a child, did you want that child? What's the bias? To say yes. I mean, it's very, you have to really not like, not like that child in order to say, oh yeah, I had him, but I didn't want him. <laughs> you know, it, it happens and you see that 40% that of women uh, do say that, but this is data is probably biased to put more kids in this category than what the woman really uh, feels, although again, uh, intentions are, are, are very changeable and attitudes uh, toward other people, husbands, children, you know, one minute you love them, next minute you hate them, and, and, and so forth. So that's problematic, uh, the data there. So, an, oh, so one way of getting around that particular problem is to ask them, do you want another child in the future? Because that's, that's more volitional. That's not saying I did something wrong or something that I didn't want. And so here's that uh, set of data. Again, all this from the same demographic and health survey. And again, it's sort of what you'd expect. This is women who don't want, want to stop childbearing, don't want any more children. If they've had no children already, very, f smooth, f very few of them don't, wa don't want any children, six, six and a half percent. If they've had one child, 30, already 30% 30 say one child's enough, I'm ready to stop. If they had two children, you're up to two thirds of the women now say that's enough for me, I want to stop. And when you get to three, you're almost at the maximum. And then four and above, you're into the 92, uh, 91, 92%. So you notice it's kind of interesting that it rises and then it stays flat. So there's about 8% of women who, no matter how many children they have, they always say, no, I want more. I don't want to stop. So this is what we call very traditional women, uh, that as many as God gives me, uh, here, here comes. <laughs> Uh, in, in one version or another, but it's 8%. It's a very small number of women who don't seem to have an idea that of some number at which they want to stop, or some of them they've already had, whether they want to now, now stop. Okay, so now you can, you can ask another kind of question. Uh, you say, this is called an, an ideal number of children, and you ask a question like, if you could go back to the beginning, before you had any children, how many children would you have wanted as your ideal number? And you get these kind of numbers that women who have no children want to have two point, who now have no children, asking what they think their ideal was, they want 2.1 children. Women who already have one children, 2.1. Those that have two, say 2.4, and then the number goes on up, including women who have six or more uh, uh, children. Now, it's pretty uh, clear you know, that, that one should really expect this kind of thing, because the simplest, most obvious reason, women who want more children have more children. So, as you have more children, that's a sign that you wanted more children. <laughs> that's certainly maybe the biggest factor, just a very simple uh, kind of thing. Another factor is women who've had more children are older. Remember, we're talking about a period in history, I mean, this is recent, where ideas are changing, fertility is changing, standards and norms and personal desires are changing. So these older women, just by the age factor, will probably be of a somewhat older generation. And I won't go into it, but this looks at that. Here is the age of a woman. And again, how many, if you went back to the beginning, how many children would you have liked? And you get just an age factor, not wildly different from this. So just generational change uh, is a bigger factor in that than uh, you might expect. And also in, in this rise is what we've just talked about, that women already had a bunch of children. You know, when they reconstruct back what they used to think, or now think that they would think, they, you know, again, well, I have three, I'm either happy or whatever they think about it, it's hard for them to say, no, I don't want uh, this many. So have you noticed anything funny now? Anything about the number, these numbers and the number I told you to remember? No class of woman wants more than 3.3 children. 
Most of the women are in the two range, and only those that have six and more children want 3.3. And the same, if you look it out by age, no group of women wants more than three. What did I say about how many they're having? 3.8. So, okay, this now accords with the other stuff that you've seen that women want, few, looks like women want fewer children than they're having. Well, this is Bolivia. Uh, maybe there's something a little bit special uh, about Bolivia. And you always have to check and see whether you're getting some sort of outlier or is this the general situation. So, that you don't have to look at that too closely yet. Uh, so, one of the, uh, uh, an economist at the World Bank, a guy named Lant Pritchett, uh, did a paper, and the first thing he did was collect all that data uh, that from every country, and these demographic and health surveys are published uh, every time a country does its own statistical uh, demographic survey. And so, all of this information is available, and, and now it's computerized and, and so forth. And it's, there's a, a uniformity, there's a, com a group called Macro International that sort of helps uh, these various countries design these surveys so that they can be com com compared internationally and get fairly good comparability of the data. And what he did is, of these various ways, various statistical ways of finding out how many children women want, and they have different numbers. This is average ideal number of children. This is desired total fertility rate. Uh, and here's the third one, the wanted total fertility rate. And they all correct for different factors in different ways. But the only thing I think that you have to sort of notice is that, uh, whoops, that they're all about the same. No matter how you spin this, you get a picture that looks something like this. And uh, what is it? Wanted TFR, in this case, is how many children does the woman want? Self-report, this is how many she says she wants. She wants two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is the total fertility rate. How many children is she actually having? having? So the countries are luckily all named here, and you can see uh, Syria, for instance. The uh, women want five children, and they're having seven point something uh, children. Uh, here is, pick another one, Pakistan. They want four children, they're having six children. And so you, you can look at that, and every country uh, is in there. And one important thing is how important the desire, whatever children want, that there's a very strong correlation between the number of children that you want and the number of children you actually have, aggregated by country. I mean, we're taking a lot of people and lumping them into two numbers, this number and this number, and the great variation, of course, within each country. But that's certainly an important factor. But the key line, because uh, Pritchett, in gathering this data, wanted to make a different point, which we're not going to get to today, but he lev leaves out a really important line here, which is this line that I've drawn this in. And what line is that? That's the line where it's if you want two children, you have two children. If you want three children, you have three children. If you want nine children, you have nine children. So any country that was on that line, people are having the number of children that they want. What do you notice about all these countries? Every single one of them is above the line, meaning that in every single country, they're having more children than they want. It's what they want, that's what they have. They're all above that line of equality. This is some of the cleanest social science data I have ever seen, the way they're all one side of a line, they they're follow very nicely the regression line. This is the regression line that he drew in, which is just a line uh, that uh, is closest to all the points together, a statistical way of making a line as close as possible to all uh, of, of the points. So this, this gap here, between what people want, if they, if they got what they wanted, and what they're actually having, is called unmet need. Very complicated idea, much argued about, and, and Vina may or may not discuss it, but what it tells you is a, uh, that there's a, there's a very noticeable difference between, uh, it's describing that difference between the number of children people have and, and what they want. 
And it's roughly one child uh, per family here. And this number, in principle, should, should be one and a half children, but there's certain connections. It's actually about one child uh, per family, the difference between what they have and, and what they want. Now, um, in the developing world, this is a little bit old data, but in the developing world today, the average fertility rate is about 3.5. In order to come to stable population in the developing world, it has to come down to 2.1. But if all the women here in these countries that are reporting what they want, if they actually had the number of children that they want, you'd subtract out from the 3.5, one child, you're down to 2.5, and you're actually very close then to replace what's called replacement level fertility, this 2.5. One children. And so this difference of what women want and what they have is an extremely uh, important uh, issue. And one version of the kind of thing that Planned Parenthood and other international and domestic organizations do is help women get to the fertility that they want, as not as pushing them into something, but uh, giving them something that they already want. <coughs> so, but this data, as in all data, brings up a whole bunch of questions. One, does this really reflect people's data? Have we actually, have these kind of questions and this kind of statistical analysis really tapped into the real emotions and feelings uh, of the people? You always have to question these kind of survey data. And you remember that you read this, this um, in the readings in Africa, that when the women were asked, how many children do you want, it was a meaningless question to them. They said, whatever Allah says, whatever God says, they can't, uh, it, you're just not in there with the technical term is calculus of rational choice. Well, there's women like that in this survey, and what number do you put down uh, uh, for them? Um, uh, this woman, as I've said, is, basically is all collected from women. What about men? Do men want more children? Do they want the same? Do they want less? Is it women's desires don't matter? Is it men's desires that, that, that really matter? Um, why do women uh, up here in, in Kenya and Mali at this time want so many children and have so many children, whereas con countries you might not think of wildly different, Trinidad, Dominican Republic, uh, Fiji, you know, various other places are way down here. Why some countries here and some countries uh, there? Um, Another thing is that in most of the world, uh, people actually know about contraception. And here is uh, data, again, from the Bolivian survey, 2003. And <coughs> do they know of method of contraception? Well, if they know any method, yeah. 95% of the women know about contraception. <coughs> and even the modern methods, which are listed here, 92% of the women, they know about it. And many of the women know about more than one method. So 80% know about the pill, another 80% the IUD, another 80% the injectables. That means there's a lot of overlap between these. They, not, they don't know one method, they know two, three. Um, male condom they know about, female sterilization they know about, and so, so on. This is lactational amenorrhea, <coughs> which is the traditional method that we've talked about of, of, of spacing births. And half the women know that if you breastfeed, uh, you prolong uh, the interval between your births. Not only do they know about the method, but they've used the method. 77% of women have tried something. A fair amount of that is 20% 20, 20 of these women are using only traditional methods, uh, which is, includes uh, rhythm-type methods. And, but still, 57% have actually used a modern method. <coughs> Currently using, drops down. They've tried it, and for some reason, they've stopped. Um, so, one is this medical uh, problem, that the dominant reason why women say they're not using contraception, so you've seen the data, they want to stop childbearing, it's overwhelming. You saw like, uh, I believe you, what was the final number? I don't even know, I pointed that out, 70%, I think. Uh, let's go back here, try to find, oh, thank you. 
wherever that came from. Uh, something like 70% of the women say, I don't want any more children ever. I want to just plain old stop. And then if you add in those that are not sure about the future, but they say, well, at least not in the next two years, and then beyond two years, I don't know. So you add at least another 10%. Something like 80% of women want some kind of protection. They either want to mostly stop totally or uh, at least for the next two years. And you can even go down. This is, again, older data from Bolivia. That's one of my favorite places. I was spent some good times there. Um, if you just take teenagers, age 15 to 19, already about 40% of them say, I've had all the children I want for the whole rest of my life. And the average age of that sample is 17 uh, years old. So you have th this huge number of women who don't want, want to stop childbearing. And yet if you look from the demographic and health surveys at the uh, contraceptive prevalence, like in Bolivia, again, at the time of the Roby article that you have read last night or are going to read, uh, the women who want protection either, either the, uh, are about, were about 80%, and the women that were using protection was like 12%. And you, you ask them why. And mo largely, uh, and especially more and more recently, it's medical reasons. There's, first of all, a campaign by, by conservative uh, and especially religious people in places like Kenya to, uh, they're opposed to the use of contraception, and they really blow up uh, medical problems. So the people are getting very poor in information on it. Now here's, here's an example. So uh, one of the undergraduates that took this course some years back, a uh, very uh, energetic young lady, and she was, got interested in this stuff, and so I arranged for her to go to Kenya to answer exactly this, this question. Why is it that women, and you'll hear a little later, why is it that women uh, who say they don't want any children, they're living in Nairobi, and there's plenty of contraceptives available in Nairobi, and you can get them more or less free, uh, or small cost, and they're not using it, then they get pregnant. And they can't have that baby. They don't want the baby. So they go to some bush doctor. Some, you know, it's illegal in most of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, all of Africa. Abortion is illegal, but here they are pregnant. So they go to some horrible uh, doctor. And the death rate is very, very high. So here's women who don't want children, uh, don't use contraception, even though it's available to them. And yet when they get pregnant, they're willing to undergo uh, an operation, a, a, a a very crude, op uh, uh, illegal operation by an untrained practitioner uh, that, that will lead to a very high rate of death, and they're well, uh, well aware of that. They, everybody knows somebody who's died from a botched uh, abortion. And you've read some of that in the, Europe, in, the, in the era in America and Europe when that was uh, common. So she went there, and it turns out that women uh, are very much influenced by rumors, what they hear, because their education is not really their, their thing. And so she this student, this Yale undergraduate, uh, collected these rumors. And one of the rumors, one of the, the most extreme rumor was, well, mostly in Africa, and I think you read this, uh, the, the, the you know, people that haven't been to the university don't distinguish between stomach and uterus. It's all one big cavity there. Was that in one of your readings? I think it was. In, in, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's all one thing there. So now you take a pill. And they know something about pills, penicillin, everything. But every day for the rest of my life, why do I have to keep taking this pill? Why don't I take a pill and that, that, that settles the issue? Well, they figure, I get pregnant and, the, and the, the fetus starts to grow inside me. Well, what does the pill do? The pill goes down and dissolves. They have some idea that it's wet, so it dissolves. And then reforms over the fetus and starts coating it. But every day they know the fetus is getting bigger, so you need to take another pill to add to the coat of it. And at the end, what you, you, you grow and what you get is a mummy. You get a fetus that can be fully grown or nearly fully coated with white stuff like an egg, and that's what you deliver. Well, if you believe something like that, you're not going to go anywhere near pills, right? And it, some these similar kind of stories happen with uh, everything else. This young lady herself got the, the five little uh, silastic implants in her arm. When she came back, she was very, she got it in Kenya. One, because she wanted it, and two, she wanted to show the women, see, it's not dangerous. I, 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 I'm even doing it myself. But that's irrelevant. Okay, so the one thing is the, the, any, no clue about 
medical stuff, physiology, digestion, anatomy in, inside. You know, huge numbers of women don't have any clue about this. But this girl uh, did a very clever thing. You know, she was a Yaley. And she then asked the women, you know, uh, Kenyan women are not any stupider than anybody else. They're, they're smart women. They said, do you believe such a rumor? Because they were just reporting it as a rumor. And the women were, of course, very skeptical of this. Well, I've heard that. You know, is it true or not? And they were properly skeptical of it. So she collected this whole range of rumors. And she found that she asked, which ones do you believe more than others? And she sort of could get a, a ranking on it. And then she asked all kinds of questions. And it turned out that it was very simple that they believed something depending on how many times they had heard it. And this particular rumor was not one of the most prevalent. Some other rumors were equally not true. But if you hear it a lot, then you believe it. Because they don't have a sense of uh, expertise, scientific competency, any of that sort of stuff. And a, 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 a sociologist at Penn, Susan Watkins, who I may have mentioned before and certainly will mention again, who works in, in Kenya, in the Luo region, different, not in Nairobi, a different region, uh, she uh, attended uh, a lecture where a local woman speaking the local dialect had gone to Nairobi and gotten trained, a, a nurse type. She wasn't a tra uh, an official nurse, but uh, working in that kind of assembly. Went to Nairobi and got trained to be a, a, a reproductive health educator. So she comes back and is having some sort of a white coat or uniform or a blouse or something. And she gives a lecture to the women. With, uh, they have these model babe, models of pregnancy, models of internal anatomy, slides. Very nice. And she, she was good at it. And the women were absolutely rapt. You know, they're listening to every word. But as they left the room, they started sort of staring at each other. Well, you know, what are we going to make out of this? And outside, there was a woman scrubbing the floor, a washerwoman there. And these women just dove onto the washerwoman and said, is she telling, what's she telling us true? Is this good for us? Is she the, our kind of women? That the, and, 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 and really asked the washerwoman all kinds of questions about this information, which the washerwoman had no technical expertise. The idea, idea being that they don't have this sense of that knowledge comes from some sort of expertise. That more knowledge comes from someone like me is a more important variable than that you've been to Nairobi and gotten some kind of training. And the washerwoman they perceived was closer to them than the woman who had gotten some education, even though it was a local a person from that, that local community. So it's a very complicated issue. And the big battle is, in, in people thinking about this and trying to do something about it, is sort of what she said, how much of this difference and, and how much of, of the people in general having more problems, how much of it is, th is that there's something wrong with this data that they really do want a lot of children. And many of them, you know, many countries were up there and they wanted five, six, seven, eight uh, children. And how much of it is uh, they don't have access. Now, access, so I have to, I guess I have to stop. Access, you're, you're, but you're not leaving. <laughs> access doesn't mean just handing out condoms. So there's, there's a famous, I'll tell this last story and I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, so there's a famous story that passes around family planning circles about someone going into an African village and finding in front of each hut a, a, a stick, and, a, and the stick was an unrolled condom. <laughs> and they go, well, that was very strange. And so they went and asked what this is. Oh, we had a family planning worker come here, and they showed us how to prevent pregnancy. And they had this stick, and, and, and they, they showed us how to unroll it, and they did that. And I've heard this kind of story any number of times, and I tossed it off. You know, it's something like I had a little, the doubts, well, more doubts. I just tossed the story off. Then I'm in Klein Tower, and I came out one night. I worked late, and then the forestry was having a party. And, and some uh, of, the, of the graduate students were out back uh, smoking or chatting or something. So I, I chatted them up. And one of them had been in an, uh, a part of South Africa called Transke. And what she told me is she went into this village. And what did she see? It, wasn't, it was cucumbers. And all the people had cucumbers with condoms <laughs> unrolled on. So this is a student who's here at Yale right now that saw this with her own eyes. So it's another one of these amazing stories that's true and gives you sort of at least an anecdotal hint into what's going on uh, be, uh, scratching beneath uh, this, this data. OK, see you next week.